in mobile apps, if you see a rotation or something moving along a circular axis, it is using trigonometry. The same trigonometry that can feel abstract and tedious when learning it at school can suddenly feel fun and exciting when seen under the prism of app development. I'm William, recording from beautiful Zurich, Switzerland, and this is the math behind animations, a series where we explore the simple and yet powerful mathematical tools which are used behind everyday user interactions. And our first stop is on trigonometry. In this video, I would like to briefly go over some definitions and show you three examples where trigonometry can be leveraged to build delightful user experiences. Let's rotate an object. We can express its rotation using two units, degrees, here we are rotating the objects to 90 degrees, or using radians. In that case, that would be pi divided by two, which is approximately 1.57 radians. Expressing the rotation here in radians doesn't feel much easier, so why would we use radians? Let's draw a circle. The perimeter of a circle is radius times 2 pi, and here 2 pi is the angle made by the full circle in radians. We can generalize this formula by the length of an arc circle being equal to radius times the angle of the arc circle in radians. The length of an arc circle is useful information if you want to draw a circular progress bar. Imagine a circular progress bar being at 75%. We know that the angle is 3 quarter of 2 pi, 1.5 pi, and more importantly, the length of the arc circle is radius times 1.5 pi. And now radians, which didn't feel like a useful unit when doing our rotation earlier, suddenly feel extremely useful when used in this context. There is a constant named tau, which is equal to 2 pi. And while preparing this video, I researched why we are using pi instead of tau. To express the full revolution of a circle, it would be radius times tau, which might feel simpler than radius times 2 pi. And number field has a great video on this topic, link in the video description. Now we can pick a point on that circle and draw two lines, one that goes through the center of the circle, and a line perpendicular to the x-axis. We are seeing a right rectangle appear, which we are going to use to briefly introduce our trigonometric functions. We can use the right triangle to define three trigonometric functions. We pick a non-perpendicular angle from the triangle. Here, we choose theta. And we can define three trigonometric functions in the following manner. Sine theta equals opposite side divided by hypotenuse. Cosine theta equals adjacent side divided by hypotenuse. And finally, tangent theta equals opposite side divided by adjacent side. There is a mnemonics to remember this, SOCATOA. SO stands for sine equals opposite divided by hypotenuse. K stands for cosine equals adjacent divided by hypotenuse, and TOA stands for tangent equals opposite divided by adjacent. Let's go back to the triangle we traced in our circle. We can apply the definition of our trigonometric functions to this triangle, and we get sine of theta equals y divided by radius, which gives us radius times sine theta being equals to the y coordinate, and cosine theta equals x divided by radius, which gives us x equals radius times cosine theta. And we have tangent theta equals y divided by x, which gives us theta being equal to arctangent of y divided by x. And this is what I like to keep in the back of my mind when thinking about trigonometry in the context of programming. There is this nice mnemonic to remember the definition of these trigonometric functions, but I'm not sure if it's so useful because you can look them up quickly on Wikipedia. 
What I like to always remember is that if I see in a source code an arc tangent, I am looking at some sort of angle formed by the origin of x and y. If I see a sign, I am looking at some sort of y coordinate. And if I'm seeing a cosine, I am looking at some sort of a x coordinate. Now, in the context of programming, we have to deal with three coordinate systems. We have the polar coordinate system, where by specifying a radius and an angle, we can select any point on our Canva. Then we have our Cartesian coordinate system, where the origin is at the center of our circle. And finally, we have the Canva coordinates from our computer program, where usually the origin is going to be at the top left of the screen and the y-axis goes from top to bottom, where in the Cartesian coordinate system, it goes from bottom to top. We can easily navigate between these three coordinate systems. First, let's start with polar coordinates. We know already that for the Cartesian coordinate system, x equals radius times cosine theta and y equals radius times sine theta. And finally, to add the Canva coordinate system, we need to translate the center to the top left. So we have x equals x prime plus cx. And we do the same for the y-axis. But of course, here the axis direction is inverted. So we multiply by minus one. And that gives us y equals minus one times y prime plus cy. Now we can do the opposite journey, go from xy to polar coordinates. First, we need to do the translation to the Cartesian coordinate system and invert the y-axis. So that gives us x prime equals x minus cx and y prime equals minus one times y minus cy. And finally, we know that theta equals arctangent of y prime divided by x prime. We can use the Pythagore theorem in our right triangle to find the radius, which would be equal to the square root of x prime square plus y prime square. Now I would like to show you three examples where we can leverage this basic knowledge of trigonometry to build delightful user experiences. Imagine a circular slider. You can drag cursors around with your finger to pick a start and end time. From the gesture system, we get the position of the finger and we need to infer the translation of the cursor based on that information. The first thing we're going to do is to convert these x and y coordinates into polar coordinates using the equations we've just seen. From there, we can update the radius of that polar coordinate to be fixed. The cursor is always staying along the same circle. Now we simply need to convert these polar coordinates back to coordinate system that our computer program can understand, Canva coordinates. Now, when looking at such an example, there are two small things we need to take into account. First, our trigonometric functions are going to return values not between 0 and 2 pi, but rather between minus pi and pi. Here we have alpha that is less than pi, so there are no issues there, but let's look at 3 quarter of 2 pi. It can also be seen as minus pi divided by 2. Here you might want to do two things. First, normalize the values to range from 0 to 2 pi, and for that we simply add a full revolution if the value is negative. And finally, you might have to deal with many revolutions of a circle. And depending on how you do things, you might have angles that are equal, for instance, to 42 times pi. To normalize this value, to go from 0 to 2 pi, we simply take the modulo of that angle. And again, if the value is negative, we add a full revolution. When swiping cards on Tinder, it might not be obvious where trigonometry is needed. But actually, when moving the cards left and right, they have a slight rotation. This means that we need to calculate the width of the rotated card so that we know by how many pixels we need to translate it to swipe left or right. If we look at our rotated card and its container, we can see two interesting right triangles appear. 
in the blue triangle, we can express sine alpha as being A1 divided by the height of the card. And we can express sine of alpha as being equals to A2 divided by the width of the card. That gives us A1 equals the height of the card times sine alpha, which is the rotation of the card. And A2 equals the width of the card times cos alpha. And finally, the translation when swiping left or right is A1 plus A2. And that gives us the final translation of the card when swiping. Now, trigonometry is all about arc of circles and right triangles. And when using the third dimension, we can find tons of these entities. Let me show you a small example. Imagine a rotating cube. Here, we are looking at the cube from the side and we want to find the value of the perspective so that our cube doesn't cut the field of view. And for the sake of the example, we want the exact value where the cube covers perfectly the field of view. Again, we can find two interesting right triangles here one formed by the perspective in red and the smaller one in blue. We can apply the tangent formula for both and we know that they are equals. That gives us tangent of alpha equals the height of the screen divided by the perspective, which is the value we are trying to calculate. And that's also equal to the height of the blue triangle, which is the height of the screen minus the size of the cube divided by the size of the cube. Now we need to extract the perspective from this equation. That gives us the intermediary step of the height of the screen being equal to the perspective times lowercase h, which is the height of the screen minus the size of the cube divided by the size of the cube. And finally, that gives us the perspective, which is equal to the size of the cube times the height of the screen divided by the height of the screen minus the size of the cube. And this gives us the exact value for which the cube covers perfectly the field of view. This video is named Beautiful Trigonometry after a video of the same name from Numberfill, which features a really fun animation built using trigonometry. We can rotate a point along a circle and we can display the x and y coordinate for that point. Again, we know that the x coordinate is the cosine and the y coordinate is the sine. Another way to see it is that the y coordinate is the cosine coordinate rotated by 90 degrees. We can rotate the cosine axis many times in the same manner. And here it looks like the circles are moving in a circular way. They are not. They all go back and forth on the straight line and the value is based on the cosine value of the rotating circle we were following. And this fun animation strengthens the notion that in programming a cosine represents some sort of x-coordinate and a sine represents some sort of y-coordinate. Now I would like you to take away three things from this video. The first is that these formulas we've just explored can sometimes, in the context of programming, feel a bit confusing because we are dealing with different origins and different coordinate systems. Stay aware of which coordinate system you are using and use APIs where you can easily navigate from one to the other. The second thing is that I always keep the following picture in mind. If I see an arctangent function, I know that this represents some sort of an angle where the origin is the origin of the x and y value that were provided to that function. A sine represents a y coordinate and a cosine represents the x coordinate. And if on top of that you are able to easily navigate between your different coordinate systems, you will be able to leverage the full power of trigonometry when building delightful user experiences. And finally, always find the right, right triangles. In the Tinder example, for instance, we had to draw the geometry of our user experience and we had two imaginary right triangles which were based on the container of the rotated card, which again doesn't really exist. Or in the three-dimensional example, we had to look at the perspective and so look at things which are not visible on screens 
but it's sometimes worth taking uh, pen and paper, draw the geometry of the user experience we're trying to build and find which are the right triangles that will be useful to uh, compute the values we need to compute. So that's it, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. This is my first time experimenting with this format. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I am looking forward to see you in the next one.